So welcome, thanks for coming to the San Francisco PHP Meetup. Um, we're here at IGN tonight, uh, kind of a attempt at a new home, so be sure to let me know how you like it, what you don't like, uh, what you'd like different next time. Um, part of the reason for the move was because I work here now. Um, it's a little bit easier for me to set up, but as always, these events are for you all, not for me. So uh, if this facility doesn't work out for you, let me know and we'll uh, either make it work or find a, go back to CBS or find another place that does. So uh, let me know your feedback. Tonight uh, we have Nick uh, Kaluger. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, Zen Framework, uh, specifically Zen application. Um, we're thinking about making this a series, kind of maybe quarterly or something. Uh, just more stuff about Zen Framework, especially as uh, version 2 is coming out kind of soon, sort of. Hopefully. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, but, you know, maybe quarterly, something like that. Next month, we have Terry Che. He's going to be giving his, uh, the cloud is your line, or developers your linemen. Crap, I forget the name of the talk. Um, Terry Che, it's going to be entertaining. Um, so that'll be good stuff. Um, next Monday is the MySQL meetup. That'll be here as well. Uh, Ryan, do you remember the topic? Akiban, yes, so uh, indexing. So if you're into MySQL and you have some really bad performing queries, you know, on the magnitude of it takes, you know, a minute or more to run, um, and it's using indexes, it's still just not good enough. Um, it's a good talk to come to. They'll show you how they can run it in just a few milliseconds. Um, you can even send us the query, and uh, they'll show us how that specific query can be optimized. Um, so tonight's meetup is sponsored also by IGN. Um, O'Reilly is providing the raffle for the books. We have five of them or so to raffle off in the background. Um, one of them will go to whoever comes up with the best random number generator uh, by the end of the talk. Um, and then, uh, Mike, do you want to say anything? I'm Mike Manoski. I'm the technical director at IGN. Thank you for coming tonight. I promise a very short commercial. We are, we are growing. We are looking for test automation engineers. Um, we are also looking for uh, senior software engineers with a background in video, um, and also the other senior software engineers to join our ad operations team, particularly with the front end. So I'll be at the back. Close the like Thank you. All right. And as usual, has anybody got any they're looking to be hired, looking to hire, or uh, any other good community events? So oh, send conferences next week. Send con, don't forget about that if you want to go. Sorry, we can't hear you.
permutations algorithm for memory in the whiteboard in the third round, just so you know. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, one last thing before I forget, don't forget to turn off your cell phones and laptop audio. Uh, we always have somebody to go off. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Nick. Here we go. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, like you said, I'm Nick Luger. I work here at IGN in the front end engineering department. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, what you see when you go to www.ign.com. Uh, I've been using PHP for about 10 years now and Zen Framework since uh, 2007. Um, I went to ZenCon that year, learned about Zen Framework, and I've been using it ever since. I highly recommend ZenCon if you can go. Um, and I also highly recommend if you can come back and see Terry Che next month. He'll be much more entertaining than I will be, I guarantee it. Uh, very good speaker. So. Uh, so like Mike said, we're going to talk about Zen application tonight. Um, Basically, if you follow the Zen Framework tutorial, you're going to get a running Zen, Zen Framework application, no problem. Uh, the point of this talk is to understand more about the internals of how Zen application works. The other major package that you want to understand would be Zen Controller. Um, and like Mike said, we're going to hopefully start a series of talks on various Zen Framework modules. So hopefully those will be the first two, and we'll move on into some of the other interesting components. Um, so if you understand the internals of these two major components, you can extend Zen Framework properly. You can uh, create resource plugins, action helpers, controller plugins. Um, it'll also help you architect your applications better. Um, if you follow some of the standard ways to use an application, it kind of leads you towards dependency injection versus global objects. Um, it'll, tell, it'll show you where to put your application logic in the correct classes. And you can also implement application logic in reusable modules. Uh, Another thing that you, you'll get out of this is you can foresee potential uh, performance bottlenecks. Um, so that's a lot of what we do here is serve a very high traffic Zen framework application. So performance is a major, uh, major concern of ours. So um, the first thing you're going to get if you use uh, if you do the Zen framework tutorial is they're going to take you into the index.php file. And we'll just go over a few quick things. Um, you'll see that the first thing that happens is a couple constants get defined. Um, the next thing is it sets up your include path. Um, we're going to go over include path in a little bit, but you really want to uh, limit your include path to be the library if possible. Um, and then the next thing you do is instantiate a Zend application. So all your requests are going to come through this file, and you're going to instantiate a new Zend application, which will bootstrap the application for you. So what happens when you instantiate a Zend application? Um, the first thing that happens is they store an environment variable. The environment variable is what tells you, OK, I'm in production, or I'm in staging, or I'm in my development environment. Um, another one that we use is unit testing. So a lot of times we'll want to do different things when we're running our unit tests. Um, the next thing that happens is it stores a singleton instance of Zen loader autoloader. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about the autoloader later, but basically this gets you out of having to require every single file that you're going to use throughout your application. Um, it sh ensures options is an array. Um, what that really means is it can take a, it can take a, a number of different arguments. Um, most commonly, you're going to pass in a configuration INI file or configuration XML file. Uh, you can also pass in a concrete instance of Zen config, or you can pass an array. Um, an array is uh, one way that you could um, make your PHP application perform better by having that compile, uh, not compile, but being loaded by APC or being stored in APC uh, by the opcode cache. So the next thing that happens is uh, set options. Um, this is a handy, handy, there's a handy trick in here that um, it looks for config uh, directives in that options array, and that allows you to include multiple other files. So if you have a unwieldy configuration, like you're using Zen Navigation, those, those configs usually get really large. And so rather than put that all in your main application file, you could tell your main application file to point to other config files that will get loaded during application bootstrap. Um, it stores the options in an instance variable, and then it processes some special options. So instead of having a, uh, 
a, a lot of procedural code that has your PHP settings, um, other include paths, autoloader namespace, things like that. You can put that in your configuration file and Zend op application will automatically call uh, like INI set on, uh, in the case of uh, include paths, I'm sorry, in the case of uh, PHP settings and so on. Okay, so um, during during Zen application instantiation, there's a special option that says, okay, if you specified bootstrap, I'm gonna instantiate a bootstrap object as well. Uh, what that does is uh, it takes the application as an argument, um, it retrieves the options from application and calls set options on that object as well. Um, it merges all the options together and one uh, one, one that you'll want to be aware of is called plugin paths. And what that does is it tells you, it tells Zend Framework where it can find additional resource plugins. Uh, we'll get into the resource plugins a little bit more, but just to clue you in, it's uh, things like database configuration, um, logging configuration, mail configuration, anything that you want to configure, configure can be done with a plugin uh, resource. The other thing it does is it is it loops over each of the array, um, each of the array items that were specified in config. Uh, it'll call a setter function in in the Bootstrap that will basically store that option in your Bootstrap if you need it later. Um, one one special one here is resources. Uh, we'll go over more of how resources work, but it does those a little differently. It it loops over each resource, registering the key as a resource plugin. Another, another key one here is called the app namespace. And what the app namespace is, is in your, in your Zen Framework application directory, you're going to have controllers, you're going to have models, you're going to have forms, uh, you can have DB tables, plugin services, etc. By setting the app namespace, it'll know what to prefix your uh, your classes with, say you have, you just wanted to call your application like application or if you wanted to call your application uh, foo or whatever, it's going to prefix that in the class name and it's also going to automatically determine using reflection where to find all those resources for you. If you end up using the model, I'm um, sorry, modules resource, the modules resource can also have these uh, resource uh, resources available in each module. Okay, so what's an autoloader? Um, an autoloader is, in PHP, is automatically called in case you're trying to use a class or interface which hasn't been defined yet. So basically right before PHP is gonna fail, uh, fatal error, it's going to try to autoload a class for you, or autoload a file for you that contains that class. So SPL autoload is the default implementation for uh, underscore underscore autoload. This function is intended to be used as a default implementation. If you don't specify anything in SPL autoload register, it's called with, um, I'm sorry. If nothing else is specified and SPL autoload register is called without any parameters, then this function will be used for any, th any later calls to underscore underscore autoload. The default behavior in PHP is going to be checking in each include path. Uh, it's going to lowercase the class name and it's going to try to append .inc or .php. So this gets into performance where if you have a large include path, uh, it's going to have to search each one of those include paths either before it finds success, ideally sooner in that loop, uh, or it's gonna fail at the end of that. So. so here's how you would implement the probably the most simplest uh, autoload function. Um, it basically says, okay, take the class name, include it by adding .php at the end. And I'm going to break real quick here. I've got a, just you know a couple things just to make sure that auto loading is clear. So what I have here is a I've defined the underscore underscore auto load function. It just takes the class name, and I'm going to say new foo, and foo is defined in this function called I'm sorry this file called foo.php. So if I execute this. It's going to know to include the correct file, instantiate a foo object, and uh, I just had it dump. Another way you can do this is just call SPL autoload register, 
And like I mentioned, what happens there is it's going to lowercase the file name and instantiate that class. So you can see there, it found that file, included it, and then dumped it after instantiating. Okay, um, another way you can do auto-loading in PHP is you can register callback functions. Um, you can register one or more auto-loaders, and they'll be executed in the order defined. Uh, the parameters are auto-load function, so that's going to be your callback. Throw, whether or not to throw exceptions, and then prepend. So unless you say prepend true, it's going to put it at the end of the, of the stack. You can prepend it to the stack as well. So now, that's how auto-loading works in general in PHP. If you want to, if you want to, if you're going to use Zend application, it's going to set up a little bit different auto-loading for you. Um, the first thing it's going to do is register a static function in the Zend loader auto-loader class called this the auto-load function. Um, in that function, what it's going to do is use Zen loader load class as the default autoloader. That, that can be replaced, but if you just use Zen framework, uh, Zen application out of the box, that's how it's going to work. And what that does is it replaces underscores with directory separator, so on Linux slash or Windows, the other slash. Uh, it adds .php and doesn't include once, trying to find the file in the include path. So this is where you want to have uh, your include path as small as possible, and um, and ideally it would find it in in the first or second include path. Uh, by default, uh, Zen Zen application is going to know how to auto load the Zend underscore and Zend X underscore. So those those packages are going to be in your library folder in Zend application. So it will know how to find those automatically. If you, wanna, if you want to load something like my library, which would be in the my directory, and all the classes would be prefixed with my underscore, you have to tell Zend application to do that, and you can do that through configuration. You can also add concrete namespace autoloaders. This would be things, um, this could be something like, say you want to use a library that has its own autoloader that does things a little bit differently. You can tell it, okay, I'm going to, everything, every class that's, you know, Prepended, like a good example would be like Doctrine, the the ORM. If you're going to use Doctrine, you probably want to push the Doctrine autoloader on there first. It'll know how to find the Doctrine autoloaders according to its autoload capabilities. Uh, and I have namespaced in there because these are um, these are sort of vendor prefixes, not really PHP 5.3 namespaces. So just to be clear. Okay, uh, so I've been kind of hyping on harping on uh, performance considerations. Um, so these come straight from the uh, Zen Framework uh, manual. Uh, optimize include paths. Um, this means use absolute paths if you can. So if you know exactly where a file is, uh, use that so it doesn't have to search through your include path. Um, reduce the number of include path entries. The library should be first in the include path. And the reason this is is because a lot of your application is going to be trying to find Zend uh, Zen library classes or your library classes. So you want to have the library as the first choice for the autoloader to fund. Um, if possible, don't include the current directory. Um, there's almost never a case where you're going to have um, other PHP files that you're going to need. So in, I'm sorry, in your in your current working directory when you're running your application. So you can usually get away with not having the current directory. And then lazy loading classes. So that, all that means is that um, you don't want to require classes until the very last minute right before you need to use them. Because if you don't end up using them, you've wasted time uh, statting the file system, finding the file, including or requiring the file, and so on. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit in the Zen manual that gives you a, a Linux command line to actually strip all the require onces out of the Zen framework library. I uh, highly recommend doing that. You can even do that in your own libraries as well. Um, the last part about performance is uh, plugins in Zen Framework. So plugins are used um, in a number of different places to find action helpers, filters, form decorators, view helpers, and other things. Um, the plugin loader allows you to um, add prefixes and paths um, in multiple paths per prefix. So what that means is it's going to have to loop through those in order to find uh, the correct file. 
So if you can if you can minimize uh, the plugin paths, that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing you can do is use this thing called a include file cache. And what that's going to do is it's going to generate a PHP script that can be cached by APC um, that will have all of your includes for plugins. Um, this is one where you need to do some benchmarking on your application. So depending on your particular application, the uh, the include file cache could or it, it could it could be beneficial, but it may be a performance hit because uh, you just have so many plugins you're loading on particular requests that it makes that that thing huge. Mm -hmm. Correct. So uh, his comment was that um, if you don't use uh, full paths, you're not going to gain uh, all the benefits from APC, and that's correct. Um, one trick you can also do is if you do use relative paths, make sure you call real path first, um, and that will uh, compute the actual real path before uh, including it. So. Okay, uh, so now on to a few more details about uh, bootstrapping. So after you've instantiated Zend application, the next thing you're going to do is call Bootstrap. So what we're going to do is walk through what actually happens uh, when you call Bootstrap. So usually you'll want to implement a Bootstrap class, and you'll put this in the application directory of your Zend framework uh, project. Uh, you'll normally want to extend uh, Zend application Bootstrap Bootstrap. That's a concrete class. It offers uh, a few benefits. Um, it also uh, it extends from Zen application bootstrap, bootstrap abstract. That's where the guts of bootstrap is implemented. Um, I normally just extend the concrete class because it has a couple of niceties in there. Um, so this is your bootstrap class before you get started on any development. So in your bootstrap class, you can put something's called resource methods. And what resource methods are is anything that it finds that has underscore init as the function name, it's going to call that function for you. So you can see I have a number of init functions here. I normally want to do something useful. Um, I think I get into it in a little bit here. Um, you'll normally want to return something as well from those resource methods. I'll show you why in a sec. Um, so when you, when you instantiate Zen application, you call bootstrap. Normally, you're going to call bootstrap without any parameters. And this is going to uh, bootstrap every resource that you've uh, created, so all those functions. If you have a situation where you're maybe running like a CLI script, it's like it's not during a web request. This is something that's offline uh, in asynchronous processes. You'll probably want to. Uh, you'll probably want to bootstrap just particular resources. So you can say, okay, I'm only going to bootstrap foo, or I'm going to bootstrap uh, foo and bar by passing this array. And that, um, that will improve performance because it won't bootstrap unnecessary resources. So those were resource functions. Uh, very useful, but what you end up wanting to do is use what's called resource plugins a lot of times. And resource plugins are nice is be because they're reusable. Um, they are actual classes in uh, your library normally. And, and you can enable them or disable them, disable them by, via configuration. So if you have different configurations uh, based on certain parameters, then you can bootstrap different resources based on that configuration. So um, if you want to do resource plugins, you need to implement Zend Application Bootstrap Resource Bootstrapper. But if we go back to here, you can see where I extend Zend Application Bootstrap Bootstrap. That concrete class, as well as, as well as the class it extends for an abstract class, already implements this for you. So you, you automatically get these resource plugins for free if you extend that concrete class. To use resource plugins, you specify them in options passed to Zend application. So normally when you pass in, you're going to say new Zend application, application environment, and you're going to usually give it a config file. Um, in this example, I'm just showing that, that you can pass in an array. Um, and what this says is that, okay, 
everything under resources is going to be viewed as a resource plugin. So this says I'm going to use a front co controller resource plugin and I'm going to give it an array of options, in this case just the controller directory. So that just tells it where to find my controllers. Um, Zen Framework ships with a lot of uh, really useful resource plugins. Um, commonly used ones, a cache manager. It allows you to configure multiple types of caches um, that have different backends. So if you're going to use memcache some, for some things and uh, APC for other things and the file system cache for other things, you can configure those all in your um, all in your config file and it's just going to instantiate these different caches, put them in this cache manager and then you can access them later. Uh, other things like the DB. Uh, it's got DB and it's also got multi DB. So if you're connecting to more than one DB, you can configure that all, and it'll be available in your uh, in your re uh, in your resource container. Uh, the other ones like front controller, layout, view, log, mail, navigation, router. These are all components that are very common in most applications. So uh, they ship with these resource plugins for you. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so the next line. Um, so say I want to make my own resource plugins. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Zend Application that I've got plugin paths and then my resource, and it tells me, okay, I'm going to find I'm going to find some more resource plugins in application path slash resources. So what that would do is if I pass front controller in and I have a my underscore resource underscore front controller class and it's in a front controller .php file there, it's going to find my custom one first before it loads the Zen one. That allows you to implement custom logic on top of the front controller resource plugin. Um, a lot of times if you're going to use one that already ships, you can completely replace it, but most of the time you can get away with just extending the uh, Zen version and building upon that. So this is an example of a plugin that ships with Zen Framework. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you're going to want to have an, an init method. That's what gets called by uh, the bootstrap. As, as, uh, as the application's bootstrapping, it's going to say, okay, I've been configured to use the view resource. I'm going to instantiate this class and call init on it. And the init's pretty simple. All it does is gets the view. Uh, the, the get view function uh, loads options, instantiates a Zen view, um, takes care of this doc type, and returns the view. The other thing it does here is it instantiates a, uh, a view renderer. Uh, that view renderer is an action helper. It's a late running action helper that is used during the rendering of, uh, of your uh, application pages. Uh, if, we get in, if we get into uh, more of these talks, we'll definitely get into action helpers and how they work. Uh, the next thing it does is it adds that helper to the to the plugin broker. I'm sorry, to the action helper broker. That action helper broker takes care of making sure that action helper gets run. And the last one is key. It's going to return the view. And the reason you need to return the view is that the Bootstrap functions. It has a has an internal container that you're going to want to store all these resources in. So, like I said, you're going to make sure you want to uh, return an object. Um, the bootstrap abstract provides a local registry for these objects. Um, as long as you return something, it's going to be stored there. It, if your resource was keyed like view or front controller or DB, that's what's going to be used as the key in the container. So when you want to find it later, it's simply the key to the resource will be the key in the container so you can retrieve it later. So this container is, is a Zen registry by default. Um, it can be replaced by literally any object because all they're going to do is try to set a property on that object. So, for example, you could um, you could replace that container with something that's more uh, fancy, if you will, a something something like a DI container. Um, I've heard of people replacing the container with the DI container from Symphony, for example. So, there's a there's a number of things you can do there. Um, one thing to be clear on, though, is if you if you've used Zen Framework, Zen Registry. Uh, sort of implements the singleton pattern. It actually provides the option for both. So you can use Zen Registry as a singleton, which is going to put everything in the global namespace. In the case of Zen, the Zen application, the Zen Bootstrap, it's a local instance that can only be accessed from certain areas of the application. And 
you can see here it says it can be accessed from the router, the dispatcher, plugins, and action controllers. What this does is it enforces good application architecture. So if you want to use things like your DB in other parts of your application, you want to grab it from the, from the container at the proper time and inject it into other parts of your application. So be aware of that. Um, it, you know, if you end up using a, the singleton instance, all of a sudden you're going to get into a class and you're like, I need the DB. I can just get it out of the registry. That's nice and handy. But then what happens when you want to replace the DB during unit testing or something like that? So uh, sticking, sticking to how they've kind of led you into architecture applications is a good thing in this case. Uh, <clears throat> resource dependency tracking. So what this means is that my, my resource here called init request, so init request is a, is a resource function, it depends on the front controller to be bootstrap first. And all I have to do to enforce that dependency is call this bootstrap front controller. And then I know I can get the front controller back, that get that resource back very easily. And the reason I wanted the front controller is because down here, after I've instantiated now, normally you're probably going to want to do something different because you basically get a lot of this for free, but like the set base URL is a probably not a good example, but it's just I'm doing something custom to my resource object, and then I'm setting it back on the front controller. So I've got to make sure I have that front controller first. So now we're just going to talk about real quick how the bootstrap works internally. Um, so this method is going to get called by um, when, you, when you call the bootstrap method on your application. And all it's going to do is, uh, in the default case when you don't pass any parameters in, it's going to loop over all the class resource names. So those are all the I underscore init functions. Then it's going to loop over all the plugin resource names. So that's everything in your configuration that was uh, named resources. It also works well if you pass in, you know, if you pass in a a string which names a resource. It's going to try to find. It's going to call execute your resource. Um, and then if you pass in an array, it's going to loop over those and try to execute your resource on all those. Okay, so we're going to talk about just execute resource real quick. So what this does is, at this point, it's it's passing in a resource name, um, and so what it has to do is it's going to find, either find that in your init underscore init methods, or try to find the plugin resource. So it's pretty simple. Um, you can see it calls this get plugin resource. That takes care of instantiating the plugin resource. And then it's going to say return equals plugin init. Um, so like I said, it calls the init method, and then the return gets stored in the container here. Um, one thing to note real quick is, uh, let's see. You can see at the beginning of both of these conditionals here, it throws the resource name in a started array. And all that's for is as you're running these uh, and you've declared dependencies in various resources, uh, you might get into a case where um, one resource depends on another one and that same resource depends on it and you're going to get into a circular dependency case. So that started array just takes care of making sure that there's uh, no circular resource dependency and you can see it throws that exception if it, if it, if it detects that. And at the last, at the very end, you can see that it marks the resources run. Uh, so that way, if you try to so say you declare a dependency and it's already run that resource, it knows it doesn't have to run it again, it just returns it. So, so that's pretty much it. Um, that's how Zen application and Zen bootstrap work. Um, does anybody have any questions? Absolutely. That's that's a great point. Is the whole point of this is that you can you can know all this, but at the end of the day, you can get all of this stuff just by putting it in your your INI file. 
So. Uh, let me see. So this is what a typical INI file is going to look like. So you notice I have my production section here. Um, I can configure a few PHP settings, the include path, my autoloader namespaces, configure my front controller. Um, I was playing around with, with uh, Doctrine 2 here, so I think I disabled the DB stuff, um, configured my view. So you can, you can see that all these are all prefixed with resources dot. Like I've got a log here. I've got some jQuery configuration, some cache configuration. But they're all configured with resources dot. And then the nice thing is that the Zen configuration, um, it inherits just from the uh, PHP uh, INI processing. So you can use, uh, you can use the ex um, extending of configuration sections. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. So you can use the extending feature of, of, uh, of INI files, and you can override settings in your various environments. So if you want to point to a different database in your dev environment, you can easily do that by coming down here and you know con changing your configuration for your database. So um, one thing I put here is if you want to check out my GitHub, there's a ZF Quick Start set of code that <clears throat> will basically give you okay. You know, I kind of went over how everything works inside. This ZF Quick Start code, there's also a link to the presentation I gave on that, and it'll get you started in a, in a more hands-on way. Um, so I recommend checking that out if you want. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit unclear about uh, the, the bootstrap object with the uh, protected init methods versus the, the bootstrap resource plugins. Can they uh, complement each other, or are they? You can use both. So it's gonna it's gonna run through both. Um, so you can see here that that <clears throat> what it does is it loops over all of the the underscore init methods first. That's the line that says uh, for each get class resource names. So that what that get class resource name does is it finds all the underscore init functions. And it's gonna execute all those. Uh, and then the next thing it's going to do is execute all the plugin resources. So um, you could definitely do like you could instant you could initialize like a database in an underscore init instead of using their plugin stuff. So very possible. And, it, and using the dependency tracking, um, you can actually mix and match. So you can see by default it's going to run through all the init methods first and then you the plugins. But if one of your init methods depends on uh, a resource plugin. Then it will be able to execute that resource plugin in there. Oh, I did that right here. So you do this bootstrap front controller. So this is in an init method actually that's going to depend on the front controller resource plugin. So that's how you can kind of intersperse them if you don't want them to run in that exact order of init methods and then plugins. So the first bone step, dependency tree, and then the first it, it doesn't really need to build the tree um, because all this is doing is it says bootstrap the front controller. And if it's already been bootstrapped, it knows not to do it again. It's just going to make it available. So you just have to make sure you retrieve it. The only thing that's different is that you implement the plugin in the class. Um, these are different than controller plugins. So if we do another Zen, Zen Framework talk, we'll probably talk more about controller plugins and action helpers. These are just resource plugins. And resource plugins are uh, implemented in class classes, and um, they're reusable. So you could have a resource plugin um, that you use in five different applications, because I really have this sweet database resource plugin that I want to use over and over again. Throw it in a resource plugin. That way, you don't have to define that in an underscore init method in each of those applications. Have you ever uh, created a structure with a modular structure in the application? 
Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, I've had I've had I've had success with that, and it's also kind of uh, trying. Um, they didn't do such a great job with modules in Zen Framework 1.0. Um, I talked to one of the developers of Zen Framework, and he his words exactly were modules weren't really a first class citizen in Zen Framework 1.0. One of the weird things is that it's actually going to bootstrap every single module on every request, even though it doesn't really need those. And the reason it does that is because during bootstrap process, it hasn't it hasn't initialized the router yet, so it doesn't know which module is going to get routed to. Um, I think that's going to get taken care of in Zen Framework 2. Um, in the meantime, there's some hacks you can do in order to get around that, but yeah. Did that answer your question at all? Yeah. Do you think we're going to see this in Framework 2 this year? I don't think we're going to see it until next year. I thought, so I thought last year at ZenCon, I was like, oh, it's going to be ready by this ZenCon for sure. But no, it's not. So there's some cool stuff that's going to be in there, like that's going to help with performance. Like one thing they're going to improve upon is the auto loader. Um, they're going to use this thing called a uh, class uh, class map hash, I believe, which is simply a fancy way of saying they're going to uh, build this PHP file that knows all the classes in your libraries. And when you when you go to uh, instantiate a, a new something, it's going to say, is that in the hash? Is that in the hash? Yes. You know, go or no fail, and that's going to be you know super quick. So that's one of the performance tweaks they're working on. Uh, is there any provision in this for coordinated startup or distributed set of computers? Startup, uh, so. Putting so, over control of our multiple um, So we use N Framework on a pretty large farm right now, um, and. I don't think we really customize anything to, to, to do it on multiple hosts. So when you get, get up into, are, are you talking in a web, like in the web paradigm, right? I just were you running the application on multiple uh, hosts and Yeah. Um, so if you're just going to load balance, um, you know, you're going to have to do the typical things. Uh, you're going to have to figure out where you're going to store your session data. Um, for example, we store our session data in memcache. Uh, and so that's, you don't really, you, once you have memcache configured properly for a cluster, then you don't have, uh, you don't you don't store the sessions on the file system. Another way to do that is use sticky sessions with your load balancer, um, and that way your your uh, sessions will be stored on the, um, on the, I'm sorry, your sessions will be stored in the file system, which is fast, and also um, the load balancer knows to hit the same host every time for a particular user agent. Um, other things, I mean, you're going to need uh, a database. If you're going to use like a relational database, you're going to want to um, put that database on probably on somewhere on a, a larger server that can be accessed by all the different web nodes. Um, and then the real the real golden rule is to get into something like a service oriented architecture where you have you can you can actually load balance another set of nodes that give you a service layer that is in front of your storage layer, your persistence layer. So that's what we do here. Um, you know, we have a, a, a second tier that is not Zen framework that is responsible for bringing back all of our persistent data from various data sources, not just MySQL. Um, so no, I don't think there's anything here that's going to stop you from doing that. Um, it's, it's using you know, tried and true tricks uh, for doing, you know, massive farms. So. Mm -hmm. um, usually, where I've seen the application is in the MVC context. Uh, is it considered too heavy to be using it for your basic web service context, or is it useful there as well? Um, you know, it, it depends. I mean, you can. It, it's it, a lot of it's your performance requirements. I would say. Um, you know you're gonna you're gonna take a hit from this bootstrapping stuff. Um, you know it's on the order of like you know you're gonna get 40 milliseconds out of this. You know almost no matter what, almost no matter what you do. So if that's your case, you know you, you might want to try something that's you know not a scripting language. Um, you know doing your service layer in like Java. Like we're, we're doing a lot of service layer stuff in Java. We also have service layer stuff in uh, Rails here. So. Um, Um, you only have to do a couple things. Um, I think you need to 
implement a, uh, is it a, it's a special request object that is like a CLI version. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, I've done it, I haven't done it in a while, but it's not too bad. Uh, and it basically just takes the place of your request HTTP object. It, it, it extends the request abstract object. So, yeah. Uh, normally, let's see. I think, I think there may be. I can look. By the way, what was the question? We can't. Oh, um, it was uh, how much hackery do you have to do to instantiate this stuff from a CLI environment versus a web request? So let me just look at something real quick. And is there controller request? There it is. So your unit tests are usually going to use that request object instead of the the uh, regular one. There, I, there's a there's a blog post on that though, like that specific thing, and it's just a couple things you have to do. Any other questions? Zero. Yeah. Hundred percent open source. So yeah. It's I mean that's it's that's one of the reasons it's really popular. I mean Zen Zen has uh, Zen has a uh, has a interest in making PHP a commercial application uh, a more viable for commercial web applications and so they they basically invested a lot of uh, a lot of resources into making a good uh, framework for their developers to use. They also have tools like I use this IDE, for example. They have commercial versions of uh, the, the server stack. So their interest in supporting a free framework is so that they can continue to bring PHP up in the enterprise environment. So. Cool. Oh, one more. Um, you mentioned that you know there's a certain amount of overhead in the bootstrap. Uh, is there are there specific areas or partitions of the bootstrapping process that are more expensive than others? So if you wanted to try to trim that 40 milliseconds out, what would you look to cut or or get around? Um, the first thing you're going to notice is that if you specify a INI file. Uh, and you just pass that in. Uh, that's going to have to be accessed every single time, um, so it has to get you know off the file system. Now your your operating system is going to do some caching for you there. But um, one thing you know, there's a number of ways you can do it. Um, what what we're we're doing is we uh, set up a cache in advance of the bootstrap process that caches our configuration. Um, so we pull the cache, I believe, out of APC, um, and that way it's already been. Uh, processed. Um, another way that Zen recommends doing this is uh, so you can use an INI file during development, but during um, during your build process, I don't know if everybody is familiar with like building PHP applications, but a lot of times these are just tasks that you want to perform when you do a software release. But it's not like building a an I and I'm sorry, it's not like building a, a binary file, but it's setting your application up for uh, the production environment. And what you'll do is you'll process the INI files and uh, throw them into a PHP file, which then gets cached by APC. Um, so it, it loads really quickly. Uh, there's other areas that um, that I, I was actually just looking at today that um, there's some crazy loops that go on. If you're not careful and you start you know, setting a bunch of options that don't really get used, those are just going to sit there and loop and do all that. Did everybody hear that? Okay. What do you guys use? Don't you use or uh, set PHP for the service layer? Do you use other application servers? I mean, 
there's a, lot, a really, really solid adoption tool for including on Xamarin and like same service in the sole version. What did we use? Uh, what, so we primarily use REST based services and uh, they're written in, in a lot of different, uh, um, they're written in uh, Java, Rails, or I don't know if there's any other ones, but Scala is a new Java MVC framework that we're starting to use. Yeah, but the, the, the reason it just because you have themes specifically for that or because the... Uh, the it, I think in general, um, it, there's, there's, um, you know, our application, the, the front end application that's on Zen Framework, you know, we want to, you know, just serve web pages really quick. Um, so we take care of uh, caching a lot of things, uh, caching stuff from the back end. The back end is there to build our domain logic. So uh, you can you could definitely build a web application in Zen and build all your domain logic, your domain models and everything in your Zen framework application. But it's nice to have that layer of uh, service that you can, as long as you keep your API consistent, then you can substitute technologies in and out, change the databases, the databases that are used. Um, you know, we use basically every database known to man back there, but I don't know that because, I know that because I hear people talking, but when I ask for a service, I just know the API to that service. I don't really care what's behind there, and they can make choices that are best for each case, whereas our front end team only has to know REST. So that's a, that's a good question. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, the the point was that the service layer allows you to uh, have different release cycles for uh, different parts of your application. So, um, you know, we we deploy our production application several times per day. Um, the team that does the service layer can deploy whenever they want as well, as long as we're in agreement on the API. Don't no, go for it. I've been thinking a lot about a lot of the framework issues lately. So, are there any um, best practices for like creational patterns that Zen framework might provide, so far as like instantiating services or things you might get in a dependency injection framework that are like preferred because we're writing something with Zen framework? Hmm. I don't know if I can answer that one off the top of my head. Okay. Hit me up on Twitter. And I'll think about that one. Anything else? So, yeah, go ahead. Cool, right? 